Hello, everyone. I am Siri Jenkins, and I am a producer of Directors Lab West Connects. For a visual description, I am sitting in a Zoom rectangle. A woman with short, dark brown and gray hair parted to one side, wearing large, dark glasses. I'm also wearing a light blue shirt with a black sweater, and my background is the of this conversation and has the hashtag DLW Connects. The Rangers Club West is the 20 year old all volunteer run organization every May um, provides an eight day intensive of workshop, panels, master classes, and more for emerging and mid career directors and choreographers from all over the I'm going to do a quick take my. Um, here that we have audio quality, but that's the case, and we're going to get here and keep going. So instead of canceling the year's lab, which was tomorrow 2020, by growing our director's hey, lab. Oh, it looks yeah. like it's improved. Has it oh, improved? Great. Go ahead. Is that better? I think it's working now. All right. Okay, apologies everyone. In case you didn't hear, I'm Cindy Marie Jenkins, one of the producers of the lab and thank you, Diana. Thanks everyone for your patience. So yes, instead of canceling this year's lab, we chose to mark 2020 by growing the community with Directors Lab West and have been overwhelmed by your responses and thoughtful questions in our first three days. Welcome now to the fourth of eight days of conversations crafted for and by theater directors and choreographers live streamed by our partners at HowlRound to their website and to our Directors Lab West Facebook page, where you can join the chat, tell us who you are and where you're turning in, tuning in from, and ask questions for the Q&A following our speakers' conversations. We want to give a big thank you to Ellie Streifer for providing ASL interpretation. Ellie is centered in her screen with a black background, she wears a dark green short sleeve shirt, dark glasses, and has her hair pulled back into a ponytail. And now please welcome our speakers, Laurel Lawson and Diana Wyan. Laurel Lawson is an engineer and artist with a practice that includes both traditional choreography and novel ways of extending and creating art through technology and design a member of Full Radius Dance since 2004 and the Disabled Artist Collective Kinetic Light. She choreographs, teaches, and performs in New York City, Atlanta, and around the world. Thank you, Laurel. Thank you, Cindy. I am a woman with pale skin and uh, short, currently slightly unkempt, brownish reddish hair with pale eyes. I am wearing a blue shirt with a tone on tone floral pattern against a white background. I am brightly lit and I am sitting in my wheelchair. And let's also welcome Diana Wyan, who is a Los Angeles based theater and opera director, choreographer and dramaturg, as well as a curator of contemporary performance and community organizer. She's the co-founder of Plain Wood Productions and artistic director of uh, arts and culture at Temple Israel of Hollywood. Diane is also a steering committee member for the Director's Lab West. <laughs> thank you, Diane. Hi. Thank you, Cindy Marie. Hi, everybody. Um, I am seated in the center of my screen. I am a fair-skinned uh, woman with a short bob in brown. And behind me is a very cluttered background um, of my living room with a piano converted into a desk, a bookshelf, and a abstract painting and a couch behind me. So I love all the backgrounds for these. Oh, so everyone, you can find full bios for all of our speakers uh, at directorslabwest.com. Now, Laurel and Diana are going to be in conversation for about 30 minutes, and then I'll return with some questions direct from our Facebook chat and the pre-registrants. Until then, I'm going to hand the reins over to you, Diana. Thank you. Hi, Laurel. <laughs> uh, I am so thrilled to be talking with you about this topic. Um, and 
things uh, shifted because I think I didn't even expect to be present for Directors Lab West when we were planning um, our in-person lab. Um, I was actually meant to be working on tour in, in Europe. And, and so things have definitely shifted, but I am grateful to be here with you now. And so I wanna start by asking, how has the pandemic impacted you and your practice? Wow, that's a... <laughs> That's kind of a big one, Diana. It is, it is. Uh, for one thing, as with many artists, particularly dancers and choreographers, I went from pretty much being booked out for the next two to three years. Uh, I mean, the schedule was actually starting to get kind of scary years in advance. It was really exciting. And I've gone from that to uh, you know, being in this state of suspension. It's been really interesting because this is the most time I have spent at home in several years. I don't remember the last time I was literally uh, at home for a month without interruption. My choreographic practice is grounded in ensemble and partnering. So that is really hard to pursue right now. As an artist, I thrive on collaboration and on crossover. So I'm exploring some different ways of pursuing that. And I am also a product designer and a software architect. So in addition to my work in community, in crisis care, and in organizing, I am doing a lot of projects in front of a keyboard, both artistic and administrative and other technological innovation that supports the arts and that supports our community. Thank you. Yeah, it's definitely shifted a lot of things to this box. Um, something that I realized I didn't add to my visual description because it isn't visible, but I do feel like is very necessary uh, for this conversation is actually um, recognizing what is invisible, which is um, my disability. Um, I have type one diabetes. And so um, I'm excited because we're, uh, <laughs> integrating what's visible and what's invisible. And what's been really remarkable was Laurel and I got all the registration questions and um, we're gonna work through many of the themes and the questions that arose. And since we're on this digital platform, I thought we could start here. And um, cause quite a few questions remarked on how digital platforms are more accessible to disabled patrons and disabled artists. Um, and they asked if there was any chance that the theater community would use this time to make physical spaces more accessible and disability friendly. Can I lob that to you? All right, so we're yeah. straight into it. Yep. I have heard a lot about um, access and remote platforms at this time. It is absolutely true that remote access, remote presence is a vital component of accessibility for many disabled people. Something that we have really tried to pioneer in Kinetic Light is a digital transparency in live streaming rehearsals in whenever possible, offering performance live streams for people who cannot come see us on tour. However, that is only one component. Access is not automatic. It does not happen unless you make it happen. Today, we are very happy that Directors Lab West understood that we needed to have an interpreter for this conversation, that it needed to be captioned, that these are forms of access that 
we have to provide just because you're on a digital platform doesn't mean, oh, we're accessible now. Right. Access is about just thinking, what do people need? What do my artists need? What do my audience need? And it's been honestly really heartbreaking that we have seen so much progress in certain kinds of access so quickly. Remote access to education is a huge example. Disabled people have been asking for that for a long time. And suddenly, only now, does it happen. Not because it was so hard to do after all, but because it affected non-disabled people. There are brilliant organizers, artists, activists who have built their careers entirely on remote presence. One example is Alice Wong, who founded the Disability Visibility Project among a number of critical initiatives. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it can be done, but no, it it doesn't just happen magically. I wish it did. No, no, it doesn't. Even yesterday I was on a call about um, a project and I have a, a low sighted um, actor, writer, and um, you know, he brought up the fact he can't read the chat. So if we're gonna go live and wanna respond to chat questions, we gotta make those audible for him. Yep. As for the question about physical space, mm -hmm. I mean, the built environment is one of the hard aspects of accessibility. And it's something that's very easy for people to focus on. There's a ramp or there are stairs. That's not the sum total of access by any means. It's just one component, but it is a component that is probably the slowest to change. There have been a number of articles, including uh, one in Dance Magazine uh, this month, calling out not just accessibility, but what do artists need in theaters? We can't socially distance in the backstage. How mm -hmm. many times have you been in a dressing room with 20 people and no ventilation? Many. Right, so I don't know what the answer Okay, actually, I do know what the answer is to that, but people who own buildings don't like it. Yes, yeah, that's very true. Um, so when we were prepping for this conversation about disability and equity and how they can be creative forces on stage and off in our practices and for our communities and in our own lives, you and I talked a lot about the importance of language. And the this importance is actually something that's come up multiple times over the conversations, even in this series. So, okay, as somebody who was diagnosed at 20 while in college, but who didn't really come to recognize my place in our community until maybe four or five years ago, I am still processing, um, I'm still in the process of unlearning the harmful ableist language that I internalized since childhood. And since language isn't static and is always evolving and it can be utilized to empower and to oppress individuals and communities, can you help us clarify the language around disability and its impact? Honestly, it's pretty easy. Hashtag say the word. Mm -hmm. Disability is not a dirty word. Yes. We can get a little more complicated. Um, most artists at this point prefer identity first language, which is to say, I am a disabled artist. Uh, language shifts over time. 30 years ago, when I was being trained as an activist, the dominant style new then was person first language, which most of you have probably heard say person with a disability. Mm -hmm. There, and some people still prefer that, you know, you go with what the individual prefers. Uh, but there is, particularly in the arts world, an understanding that you cannot separate your identities from your personhood. Mm. It's a disservice even to people who are becoming disabled 
but pertinently, our context and lived experience matters. That is what we as storytellers use as fuel. So mm. you can't effectively create or understand your art in isolation from your disability or non-disability, just as you hopefully would not try to separate it from your gender or your race or your cultural upbringing. It is the context and viewpoint that makes our art rich, powerful, and compelling. Definitely. Oh, that resonates so much because I know I kept my diabetes out of the room for so long and I tr you know, tried to push it out of the way and it wasn't until I kind of like said, well, I'm bringing my whole self to this room that my work got stronger and I was able to create in much healthier, more robust ways. So with that said, what do we do when we make a mistake? When we say something, um, you know, using the, yeah. the euphemisms or- We, we correct do? it and we move on. You know, it's not, it doesn't have to be a big deal. Recognize that you made a mistake recognize what you want to do in the future mm -hmm. and move on. Yeah, it reminds me of yesterday with the intimacy directors. They talked about, uh, Carly brought up, oops, uh, what is it? Oops, ouch, I'm sorry, and move forward. Um, yeah. As a good way to quickly classic. move past it and not make it about you. Yeah, classic practice, because it's not about you. Mm -mm. So maybe that also brings up some of the other terminology about like special accommodations, whereas like now it's just what, a, you know, what are your accommod what accommodations do you need? Um, or, and it reminds me of like p the difference between asking for someone's preferred pronouns and just asking for their pronouns. Yeah, all of these little things, um, I mean, honestly, I know where special needs came from. And I, if I could go back and wipe that out, a disabled person's needs are not special. Uh, the term is enshrined in education. Mm -hmm. Educating a child is not a special need. They have the same need for education, for access, for the ability to exist in public space for human connection as anyone. We all have these needs. So saying that they're special is a way of shifting the burden onto the disabled individual and saying, oh, you need more. It's your fault that we're not giving this to you rather than simply creating access, providing whatever accommodation is appropriate. Yeah. Which, yeah, I could rant about that for the next. <laughs> Definitely. But maybe it's like a perfect time to talk about why you offered the word equity, you know, for the session title when we were kicking around accessibility, which is also another very important term in practice. Access is absolutely important. If access does not exist, if you or your organization is starting from a place where there is no access, then obviously you must begin there. That is the first mm -hmm. place. But we talk about equity, and I feel this conversation has just caught on in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. I do not care for inclusion because when you're talking about inclusion, that's implicitly hierarchical. Mm -hmm. Who is doing the including and who is being included and what kind of relationship does that set up? There is an expectation that, oh, I'm doing this charitable thing that makes me feel so good. Right. No, we talk about equity. Equity requires honesty. It requires an investment in sharing power. It requires sharing leadership and resources. Equity 
equity involves the ownership of stories. Right. Who gets to tell what stories? Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I think that's so important, especially with um, the conversation around power, who holds the power. I mean, I don't, I don't know when I started this, but as a director, like one, one day, I, I always start the top of my process and I repeat it whenever I feel necessary, but I tell my actors and my creative teams as well and my crew that I have one rule in my rooms and everything else is fair game. And I say, you just have to follow that one rule and that is protect yourself and others. And then I explain that I mean this spiritually, physically, and emotionally. And it's really amazing to watch the room shift as everyone recognizes their own agency to take care of themselves and one another. And I now look back and I realize that I think my original motives for this, um, bringing this into my room was actually coming out of a need to really care for myself. And now that I had more power in the room. I was no longer an actor. I was directing much, much more. Um, I could offer this because if my blood sugar is going down or going up, I got to handle it. So this one rule lets me protect myself, but also, you know, let everyone else do the same. I mean, can you, are, are there practices that you and your collaborators have adopted to create rehearsal rooms and process that can handle everyone's unique needs? Um, have you encountered any unexpected artistic discoveries along the way because of those? So this is where uh, Kinetic Light as an ensemble of disabled artists under disability leadership really grounds our practice. It is about really trust and professionalism. I mean, mm. what I hear when you, um, when you say that is that you trust your actors to be professionals, to do what they need to do. And we do the same. Yes. Trust the artists. We take care, we show care for each other by doing that. Mm -hmm. In our case, if we need to create access, then we do so. Um, and that may look a little bit different for everybody. That even can look different for me on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I don't know if I would say there are any huge surprises in that but uh, what I have learned over and over, uh, both um, working in ensemble and working as a choreographer, is that when you trust the artist, mm -hmm. sometimes they come up with something better than what I had planned for them. That, yes, I find that all the time in my work. I, I, I often think about like my role as a director sometimes to like, in addition to bringing some big vision and being able to hold the space and the whole, but is to like get rid of hindrances for the individual so that they can do their best work. So. Yeah, we just make the space and get out of the way sometimes. Yeah, amazing, yes. Um, so, oh, I wanted to share that at the National Performance Network conference um, back in December, I took this uh, great workshop by disabled actress Diana Elizabeth Jordan. Um, she might be out there. So hi, Diana, if you're out there. Um, and her workshop, like not only helped me kind of identify my privilege as an invisibly disabled director, but also introduced me to a lot of the activists who have been doing this work for decades. Um, so what advice do you have for non disabled artists who have joined us and are asking themselves, how can I build that culture of care, responsibility, and trust into my own practice? And how can I create a safe and welcoming space for my artists as well as my audience? Wow. <laughs> this is, yeah, that's something that takes a lot of practice in learning to make that space, learning to build community. I would say one thing is to consider what is actually necessary what constraints mm -hmm. do you really need? For example, common in dance studios is that you're not allowed to have anything but water in a studio. Yep. 
common to stages as well. So yeah, that's not going to work for everybody. Trust your artist to be professional to not spill or have something that has crumbs. Mm -hmm. If everyone understands what the goal is, you know, maybe that prohibition isn't actually 100% necessary. Um, considering your language, mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you are inflicting microaggressions on people, that is a stress on your artist. You know, why would you invite someone in? Again, you wouldn't bring someone into the process and then deliberately inflict more work or more pain on them. Mm -hmm. So that's something to think of ahead of time. Um, being honest, that's a really big one. If you're not prepared to do this work, don't. If you're not at a place where you can, for example, offer interpretation, you wouldn't go out and actively advertise for deaf artists to come into your process. Mm -hmm. In your audition announcements, just be honest. If your audition space is not wheelchair accessible, please say so. That's a lot better than having people show up and be like, well, those sure are stairs. Yeah. Or even doing the work to be like, okay, well, come out and I'll read for you in the parking lot. I've done that. And understanding who is doing the work there, I hope no one here would do this, but I have certainly been in situations where I've been asked to be a part of something, been cast, and then had it made clear that it was also my unpaid job to figure out all my own accommodations. Mm. Not cool. No. Hey, not there is... There is so much here and we actively invite people in to community to learn these things. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, you mentioned kinetic light a few moments ago and, um, and that work is, has intersectional disability at, as an aesthetic and as a culture and as an essential part of the artistry and that access is also central to to that process. So can you tell us more about your work and about how you're not only investigating and investing in what's happening on stage during the performances, but you're also in looking at the reception of that live performance. And um, we had a question come in that asked about how um, the work you're doing for audiences and at what point you bring them into your creative process. And I feel like it's, it's a good moment to mention um, that US census data actually reveals that one in five Americans has a disability and that we are the largest minority group and make up a significant amount of current audiences and have the potential if we aren't left out to make up even more of their audiences. So can you share a bit more about your work at Kinetic Light? And here we get to the part where we actually offer about four days worth of workshops on exactly this. Um, so as I mentioned, Kinetic Light is an ensemble of disabled artists under disability leadership. We are not, strictly speaking, a dance company. We are on stage dancing. However, it's also a uh, multi-channel production. Mm -hmm. I don't think our practices around bringing in audiences are terribly different from other uh, evening length touring productions in that we do trials, we test out, we do showings. This is all kind of very standard practice. We do try for a transparency of process mm -hmm. and we do, of course, explicitly invite our disabled community and other disabled artists into our process and to give comment. Um, 
one thing that is easy for me to point out, if you're not familiar with the state of uh, performance access for people who are blind or low vision, Mm -hmm. that practice is called audio description. And what that looks like is that you have an additional person, uh, a trained describer, usually sitting in the booth, who is watching the performance. And they are speaking into a microphone that transmits to these audience members their description of what is happening on stage. Mm -hmm. So if you imagine the difference between watching and listening to a performance, the amount of data you're taking in visually and then compressing that down to audio description that also has to be woven in if there are audible components to the performance. Right. That is that is bare minimum. That is not an artistic experience. That is begrudged and after the fact. What we created spurred by our blind friends who came to our showings and said, you know, everyone else gasped, but from the description, I didn't understand why. Uh. We understood that we were failing. So in partnership with our audience, with fellow artists, I designed Automance. If you imagine that you're in a huge room, maybe a museum gallery, and there are 30 speakers scattered around the space, and they can be anywhere, floor, floating in midair, ceiling. Every speaker is playing something different, but it's all part of the same show. And you can navigate yourself through the space. You can make choices about what you want to listen to, everything at once. You can go cuddle up to one speaker and listen to just one thing from beginning to end. That is a rich artistic experience. And that is what we create with Automance, Mm -hmm. where we are creating that content and that material alongside the choreography, alongside the projections, the video, the lighting design. And it is just as much a part of the world building as the dance you're watching on stage. Definitely. I got to listen to some of them and I definitely encourage people out there to, to head to their website and, and check out um, the recording that's uh, on SoundCloud on there. Cause it did, it gave me those moments of like, I, you know, my mind was dancing as I encountered it. I loved it. Ah, Cindy Marie. Yeah, th- uh, that seems like a good time to start to transition to our questions. Sure. Um, and we have more to talk about with Automance, which sounds amazing. Um, we got so many questions uh, from the registrant and it was hard to narrow it down, but we have a few to jump off. Uh, one was people asked, if there's any insight you can give into off working with invisible disabilities or creatives that prefer not to share about their disability for fear that it could impact their work experiences. Diana, I know you talked a little of your experience there, but. Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, as somebody who got diagnosed at 20, right as they were about to head into the profession, um, I actually spent the first at least eight years completely hiding um, hiding it. And so, um, and what that created was um, usually in a cast, um, I was acting a lot more at that point. So in a cast, I would tell one person. So if something needed to happen, one person knew, but that's not really useful. And I will say that thing of protect yourself and others and asking people for their, if their accommodation needs are being met at the top of your practice, Um, And enabling them to answer that question in real time or to pull you aside later has been really important because there are times where all of a sudden to the whole room, they're like, oh yeah, I have really bad asthma. So that really rigorous, amazing viewpoints exercise is like, if you see me sit down, that's why. Um, 
and it gives them more agency, but then it also enables them to pull me aside. I also think like kind of like disability is seen as a, a bad word, as we talked about earlier, like diabetes is one of those terms and the origins of this disease are systemic. Um, and we have to bust through that. And it's one of the reasons why like I even built an entire show after not acting anymore to really talk about that. But that's a whole other conversation. But I feel like there's also, there's a lot of us out there in positions of um, power um, who are invisibly disabled or chronically ill um, that get it. And I feel like you don't, you know, it's up to you whether you're gonna just, what you're gonna disclose, but to help the rest of the community and recognize that you can be part of um, kind of dismantling the, the shame and the fear um, because invisible disabilities doesn't mean that you can't do the work and be great at it, so. Great, and one question that came in, just came in on the Facebook Live is, um, how do you connect with other disabled artists? Uh, Michaela says that she, her, so, you know, would she approach folks in coffee shops, doctor's offices, shops, and asked, are you interested in writing and performing? Mm. Uh, that is a good question. And I think there is a really important distinction between people already in the field and working at a professional level and uh, people working in other fields who might be interested in getting involved. Mm -hmm. uh, Kinetic Light is actively engaged in lifting up and offering further training and opportunities to disabled artists who are already at least emerging in their fields. And the way we do it is largely through networks. We ask and we ask and we ask and we are always looking. In fact, we have some major information and organizing projects that we'll hopefully be able to announce very soon in that regard. However, not everyone wants to disclose, not everyone identifies you know, it is not always straightforward. And there are a lot of ways, but if you're looking for people, you know, go to where people are. Mm -hmm. That's usually a good place to start, meet them where they are. That reminds me really quick about arts marketing, where people would say, well, we haven't ASL interpreter for this one production. And I'd have to remind them that that doesn't discount all the work you need to do leading up to it to really, to you know, get people interested. Um, another question we had, I think from pre-registration is that, how do you see creative practices in dance and education intersecting in regards to disability and how to disrupt the tropes that keep surrounding the work of disabled artists? Mm. So, I mean, I think those are really two big and separate questions and I want to go for the second one first. Um, disability tropes are pretty terrible. In, in theater, in film, how often do you know someone is the villain because they're disabled? It's another common trope is inspiration porn. Me Before You was a great example of that. We are not objects of pity. My life does not suck. I have no desire to die and my life is not inherently less valuable because of my disability. That really comes down to how I talked about who owns the story, who gets to tell the story. Representation matters, not just in front of the camera, but behind the camera, in design, in technical work, in the writer's room, directors and producers. 
if you are a non-disabled director or writer who really has a burning need to tell a disability story, I mean, first I would really sit with that and understand what your motivations are around that. And then you need to find someone to work with you, hire a consultant. There are plenty of disabled writers, mm -hmm. script doctors, uh, fantastic actors and directors out there who may be happy to work with you. But yeah, representation yeah. is absolutely critical and so is authenticity. Um, as Diana said, 20% of the population and in all honesty, um, post pandemic, the number is going to be much, much higher. The disability community is bracing for a huge number of people who will have lifelong disabilities yeah. caused by this illness. So yeah, we are not the other, we are you. Yep. It also reminds me like there's the, I just uh, found out about an, a whole host of dramaturgs, um, disabled dramaturgs that are doing incredible work. So, you know, playwrights yep. and directors grab them and use them and uh, pay them. And uh, it also reminds me of how satisfying it was. I'm working on a show called The Lesson in Swimming with a three time stroke survivor um, who is low sighted and um, and it's been remarkable. We laugh about the fact that, you know, two invisibly disabled artists walk into a theater and it's really fun to see, to hear about his experiences and talk about how they relate to my experiences because we have such unique stories that got us to this place together. But there are things that he talks about that I'm like, I can totally relate to that. And I feel like if he, was in the hands of a non-disabled director, the conversation is very different. Um, but like I instantaneously knew I needed loud shoes because he can't really see very well. So my loud shoes tell him where I am approaching from, you know, and that kind of stuff is exciting to me. Um, we have a, a pretty dense question that we tried to condense down a little bit. Um, can you describe a little about what it's like to create specifically for disabled audiences versus non-disabled um, versus deliberately mixed disabled and non-disabled, create specifically with only disabled collaborators, collaborators versus with only non-disabled um, versus an intentionally integrated group? And how is the experience different when collaborating with disabled people who have different kinds of dis disabilities than you do? Hmm. Who? <laughs> yeah, a little card. Like, <laughs> that uh, that could be a seminar in and of itself. Uh, yes. Cindy Marie, how long do I have? Too long. <laughs> we have like two, we could go a little further than more than two minutes. <laughs> uh, let me see if I can come up with a ninety-second version. What what I really want to say in response to that. I don't know that I am ever creating only for one kind of audience. I can say mm -hmm. that I am considering who I am centering. And if you look at Kinetic Light's Descent, if you are a wheelchair user, there are moments in there that are a love letter to you and that no one else will ever see. So I think it's possible to create those kind of moments and to show that kind of care and love for your audience and for all of your audiences. You know, that's not, we're not necessarily building things solely for disabled audiences. We're just including and centering people who are traditionally excluded from theater, from dance, from live performance, both by the built environment, you know, the fact that, oh, there's two seats for people in wheelchairs, one on either side, so the width of the auditorium apart, and they're all the way at the back, two, 
not having interpretation, not having description, other lacks of access. Working with collaborators, and I think this is something that is true for any creator from a marginalized identity, uh, more so for multiply marginalized intersectional artists. There is a certain freedom and a certain ease when everyone understands when you are not negotiating, okay, I have these access needs that no one else in the room has, or I have to put on this performance for this very specific kind of professionalism. Um, and disability is incredibly creative. We come up with new ways to work. We come up with new kinds of work when we're working across disability, even more so. It's harder, but it can be incredibly rewarding. I think that's, uh, I think that's kind of the high points there. Diana, is there anything in that question you want to respond to? Um, well, I think you, you tackled so much of it. And the thing that I just want to double down on is like, we've had to adapt, like under the, under our given circumstances, there are adaptations and creative ways that we've found to work. You know, I used to, in my costumes, like hide sugar in random pockets or in my bra during a performance. But then, you know, there's also the ability to then create technologies, like working with costume designers to actually, um, build a place for those kinds of things into your, into your work. So I feel like there's something incredibly creative, inherently creative, um, and that could really empower a lot of rooms um, and expand the ways that we are working for the better. That seems like a great place uh, to wrap this up. I think we could probably go on for quite a while. <laughs> And there are some more questions coming in. If we have time to jump, jump into the Facebook chat after, then we'll try to um, answer everybody's questions. But in closing, uh, we're going to ask that one question we're asking everyone across the board. Would you briefly share something that you've learned or discovered during this quarantine period that you plan to incorporate into your practice as an artist? Uh, Diana, do you want to start? Sure. Whew. I lobbed this one yesterday, now I'm receiving it. Um, I think it's really exposed for me our need to control, like our, our jump to try and control things, especially as a theater director, you know, I want the lighting and the, everything to be as I've imagined it in my head or created with my team and like where we are now has like blown that apart. Um, and you kind of have to run with it and you have to adapt. And so I guess I'm okay. Like what I'm looking forward to taking with me is recognizing that the systems that are broken, like can come apart and we can rebuild something better together and find a new, reimagine the ways that we are working to unveil new ways of working that really offer opportunities for all of us to take care of ourselves and each other here. Yeah. Laurel, could you agree? I think possibly the most, the biggest component that I'm taking out of this is really exploring all of the capacities. How can I create art without being in physical proximity with people? How can I create it without being on stage, without even having a stage? So really exploring what is possible, what is, what is really innovative. Mm. Yeah, 
And I know there are a ton of questions that we are not going to get to. And as I said, I mean, we could keep going on this. There is so much more. Day. <laughs> yes. Uh, I will say I am pretty uh, available on Instagram if people have specific questions that they want to reach out about uh, at Worlds of Laurel. Um, mm-hmm. My beloved colleague and the artistic lead of Kinetic Light, Alice Shepard, is also uh, on Instagram at Wheelchair Dancer. Mm-hmm. And if you are looking for disabled artists, get in touch with us yes, because please. we are, we're collecting binders. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If you are a disabled artist or designer or technician or director, also get in touch with us. We want you on board. Yes. Yeah, and I'm more than happy as well to field anything that's out there. Um, I think this is so important and I can't thank you enough, Laurel, for joining us. Thank you, Diana. And um, thank you again, everybody. You're both um, amazing. It's been, it's always such a pleasure to talk to you and my, I always have so many things to look up afterwards and think about. Um, And thank you so much to our partners at HowlRound. Ellie Streifer, who is our ASL interpreter, we adore you. Um, we'd also very much, the Directors Lab West would like to acknowledge our long-standing partners at the Stage Directors and Choreographers Society, the Pasadena Playhouse and Boston Court Pasadena. Uh, we are usually inundating your spaces right now and we look forward to reuniting with you next year. Um, this conversation, Uh, will be archived and available with closed captions on both howlround.com and directorslabwest.com. And you'll be able to watch it on our Facebook page. We hope, we hope you'll join us again tomorrow for what is this day five? That will be day five of eight, uh, a conversation featuring global perspectives from Directors Lab West international alumni, Daniela Atiencia, Jana Formacona and Mikiko Shibuya. And it's going to be moderated by Avavit Shaked. Uh, thank you both, Laurel. Thank you so much, Diana. Yeah. Thank you, Marie. Um, we hope that this conversation sparks even more discussion and collaboration. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>